to this video about jazz guitar or actually it's not only about jazz guitar this video is about what skills you need to be a professional jazz musician and that applies to not only guitar but to many instruments and I'm making this video because there is a lot of videos on YouTube and or teachers that are teaching skills that that can be very useful but they do not actually contribute directly to becoming a good jazz musician. They train other skills that can be very impressive, but in my opinion, they can, they can somewhat waste your time and extend the time you actually need to be a gigging musician, both during live performances and also during rehearsals. So I'm, I want to just list the skills not the scales, the skills, I think you need to be both a performing musician and a musician during a rehearsal, which is somewhat different because if we start with being a performing jazz musician, uh, there's two kinds. There's the, the, the kind that plays an instrument that can only play one note at a time. So horn players, uh, violin players. I know violin, violins can play more notes, but let's just say you're a violin player in a gypsy jazz setting, so then you're mostly playing single notes uh, and other instruments that produce single notes. And then, of course, there is the, the second type, which plays chord instruments. And usually they also have to play single lines when they play solos, but if you are a rhythm guitar player in a gypsy jazz group, then only, you only need to know chords, of course. So let's start with the, the single line players. So what is expected of them during the performance? They are expected to know most themes of the song they're, songs they're performing, right? They need to be able to play that tastefully. And they are expected to play great solos, which means that they are expected to play great sounding lines that are timed well, that swing, and that outline the harmony in some kind of convincing way. That's all they need, right? There's there's nothing else they need to be able to do. Of course, they need to be able to play their instruments, but that's a given. They do not need to be able to know the chord voicings that the piano is playing. They do not need to know the guitar voicings. They don't, you know, do not need to know any of the, the fills that the rhythm guitar could play or the drummer. Right? They might know those things, but there's no need for it. As, as long as they can play great lines uh, in time and know the theme, they're probably pretty safe on stage. And I'd probably call them for a gig, or they get called for gigs all the time because that's what people are looking for. Now, if you're a chord player, then you need to be able to do all those things. If you're also playing solo, of course, you need to be able to play um, great lines in your solo. Do you need to know the themes? Depends a little bit on the setting. I mean, I've done many concerts where I was the violin player and I played all the themes. And I'm pretty sure that if I would have not played the theme in the song, then probably nobody in the band would have known the exact themes just because they were not hired to do that. And maybe we were playing unknown songs, they were hired to play chords. So as a chord player, you need to know the chords of the tunes in such a way that you can actually or you need to know chord voicings. You need to know to be able to play nice sounding chords. And um, you need to be able to play those chords in a rhythmical fashion so that they, they swing, right? And then you need to also know how to play solos and all the same things as a single line player. That is if you are a gigging musician. Now, are there any other skills you need besides those things? Not really, but I'm, I'm getting into uh, several subjects. Um, uh, mainly, I'm going to talk about ear training. I'm going to talk about rhythmic comprehension. I'm going to talk about uh, theory knowledge. I'm going to talk about knowing the style and a little bit about musical musicality. But so for the gigging musician, those are the skills that you would actually skills you would actually see on stage. The things I, I just listed. Now, the other skills I'm going to talk about are mostly, they mostly refer to, to professional musicians that also need to function well during rehearsals, right? Not only on stage gigging, 
but on also when you are learning new repertoire or forming a band. So let's start with a controversial subject and I have very specific opinions about it. And before I get into it, let me just say that these are just my opinions. They might be far from the truth, but it's the way I work and it's the way I learned how to play jazz. And keep in mind that I started playing guitar not long ago, uh, about six years ago, I started playing guitar. Before that, I could play some chords, but I could not play any single line. I had no technique. I couldn't improvise anything on guitar on any chord progression. I could already do it on violin, but I can, I can tell you that the skills that you um, need for violin improvisation, apart from the timing um, and the knowing the style, are completely different from the skills that I used to solo on guitar. So I had to actually basically start from zero. So I was looking for the fastest way to get there. So the first thing that people talk about a lot is ear training. So let's start with ear training. People talk a lot about that you need to able be able to hear chords or the, the quality of the chords. Can you hear minor chord, major chord, dominant chord, half diminished, diminished, and um, a lot of teachers are talking about that and, and, and there's people giving demonstrations. But here's the thing, you don't need to know any of, you don't, you don't need to be able to do any of that. And the reason I said it is because in practice, I've encountered lots of musicians that had trouble even distinguishing between minor and major chords. And that's not a weird thing because if you play jazz chords, and I start playing something like, uh, who's gonna be able to tell which chords those are, right? Uh, this was a two, five and D, by the way. Right? Th those chords are so out there that I wouldn't expect anyone to be able to tell which chords those are. Unless I tell them, you know, I'm playing a two, five, one and D. Then I would expect them to know what the chords are, but. I'll get to the knowing theory later. Um, so, and, and on the other side, I know, also know musicians that have amazing ears. You could play random notes on the piano or some crazy thing and they could mention all notes. But if I say, let's play rhythm changes and so we come into four, there's no good lines coming out of them. And that's because hearing, being able to hear, being able to hear chords or a collection of notes doesn't mean at all that you can play great lines. If you want to play great lines in your solo, you study great lines. You want to be able to hear all kinds of weird different chords, you study that. But that's a skill you will never need on stage. There's no, I've never seen any demonstration during a high profile jazz concert where the saxophone player is, and now for the next uh, tune, ladies and gentlemen, the piano player is gonna play some weird chords and I'm gonna say all the notes. It's just something that is a parlor trick uh, that is meant to be demonstrated on its own. It has nothing to do with being able to play a good jazz solo or to being able to play nice voicings. Because you could hear all kinds, I could play this, and maybe you could hear, well, I can hear, I can hear those notes. But it doesn't mean you would actually play those notes when I say play a nice forcing for D major seven, right? Uh, you actually have to get that forcing somewhere, hear it somewhere, and then think, oh, that, that's nice to do. So you don't need to be able to hear it to learn it. You could just have someone else show you or you, know, or you slow down recording and you look at the fingerings on the strings, all kinds of possibilities. Okay, how about hearing intervals? Um, and that means so that somebody plays two notes and you can say, oh, okay, uh, that is a tritone, right? Or a third or whatever. That is a little bit more useful, I think, just because it will enable you to copy a melody, a theme quicker if you don't know it. So you don't know a theme and somebody plays down, but it goes like this and you're able to copy it. But, but here's another thing. I've played with great soloists. I'm talking about the greatest soloist. And when we're, we had to learn a little special with a, with a note and somebody would play somebody who already knew the notes would play this little phrase of six notes, then that great soloist would hit all the wrong notes when trying to copy it. 
many times in a row, right? Even if only two notes were played. Uh, until someone said, no, you know, it's like G, B flat, C. And then they played right the first time. Uh, but they were still able to play great solos, which means that actually being able to hear intervals is not a part of playing great solos. And uh, I also know people with perfect pitch. Uh, like myself, I have perfect pitch. And I can copy a melody instantly, most of the time. It depends on how many notes there are and if I can remember them. Uh, but I know people that can do that and cannot play great solos. In fact, I could do that before I was able to improvise a solo. I could copy any theme or any lick somebody played, but I couldn't play a great solo on even a simple tune. That's because copying intervals is not the same as producing great lines on solos. Again, if you want to produce great lines on solos, you have to study great lines. If you want to do the parter trick of copying uh, notes that you hear, then you know either have perfect pitch or study hearing intervals. So, what do you need? What do you need to able uh, to hear with your ears? And those are other things. I think you need to be able to hear dynamics, right? You need to be able when you play in a band to hear when the soloist wants the band to play softer or less busy, or more busy. Oh, or louder. And that is not something that is difficult to train. That means you just got to listen to people that you play with and be sensitive to their needs when you are comping them. Right? Um, I think you need to be able to hear form. You need to be able to hear when the bridge is starting. You need to be able to hear when the top of the chorus is starting again. And that can be trained quite easily. Um, I'm going to get into that when I talk about theory. But um, chord intervals, I think it's, it's wholly unnecessary to be able to hear it. You need to be to understand what chord intervals are, so you can talk about it, right? If you want to show somebody how to play the theme to ornithology, it would be able to. It would be nice if you could tell them, you know. It's, it starts with D, G, something, right? And that's a fourth, you could know that, but just knowing the note names is probably enough. Okay, next subject, rhythm comprehension. Rhythm comprehension means exactly what it says. It means that you understand rhythms when you hear them. So if you are in a rehearsal situation and somebody says, no, I want you to play one, two, three, four, ka, ka, that you can copy that almost instantly and that's that's either because you know that you have to play uh, two chords, one on the four end and one on the one end, or just because you trained your ears so well for rhythms that you can copy that with, even without knowing, even be even without, without being able to write it down. So rhythm comprehension doesn't mean that you can write rhythms down. That that's another skill which can be very useful if you are an arranger. But if you are just a musician in rehearsal and you want to do it like an intro and somebody says, now you have to play one, two, three, uh, that you can copy that instantly. Now, you might be surprised, but there's tons of musicians that actually cannot do this, right? Uh, especially when the rhythms get more complicated. If you have, if you have to play something, something like one, two, three, for a lot of people have actually trouble copying that, right? It might sound like they're copying it, but it's not together with the rest of the band. That's because they don't really understand the relationship of the notes or the chords they have to play uh, and the beat, the, the, the continuing beat. Now, to, to train this, it's, it's actually very fun. One way to train it, an easy way to train it is to learn how to sing bebop themes, that themes by Charlie Parker or by Dizzy Gillespie or by any other bebop composer. And you don't need, even need to be able to sing the exact notes. You need to be able to sing the rhythms. So what you should do is take a recording of ornithology and try to sing the rhythms along with the recording. And you need to be able to do that with recording until you really feel that you are in sync. And then you need to be able to do that with only a metronome. Uh, 
on one and three first, but then ideally also with the metronome on two and four, although that is not completely necessary. But if you can do that, if you can sing the theme correctly uh, with, a, with a click on one, or first maybe one, two, three, four, then one and three, then two and four, if you can do that, you are training yourself to comprehend complicated rhythms, especially when you are learning complicated people themes like ornithology or confirmation or Donna Lee or dexterity. I mean, the whole Charlie Parker uh, omnibook or all those themes. If you can sing them with a click, then you are training your rhythm comprehension to great heights. And this will help you tremendously. And this will avoid a lot of frustration in rehearsals because there's all, if there's four people in the band or five people and one of them can't comprehend rhythms at the same speed as the others, it will slow down rehearsals and it's very frustrating. So instead of <laughs> training your ears to hear chords and intervals, train that. Rhythm comprehension. So it doesn't mean you need to be able to write it down. It means you need to be able to understand uh, if somebody plays a rhythm, especially a complicated one, that you need to understand where those notes are in relationship to a pulse. Okay, then uh, the next thing I want to talk about is theory knowledge. So there's also a lot of confusion about this. Um, some people think you need to know a lot about music theory to be able to play jazz or to be a performing jazz musician, but that's not the case. I mean, there are so many musicians. I mean, you could talk about the Sinti musicians, the gypsy Sinti musicians. Most of them know nothing about theory, but they are great jazz musicians, right? They sound great all the time. They play nice chords, they play great lines. And um, so obviously it's not necessary to know a lot about theory. Now, I think that knowing nothing about theory is not wise. You, you, it could have, you could still be a great musician, but it might make rehearsing more difficult. Right? Unless you are so fast that you can actually hear all the chords and, and all the intervals that you don't actually need to know any of the names because you can copy everything imme uh, immediately. That's great. Then you know, don't need to know anything about theory. Would still be very helpful actually to communicate with people that can do that. If you are a, uh, for instance, a musician that I know that has, that can hear everything instantly is Moses Rosenberg, or you know, you, you, you play with Moses Rosenberg, he doesn't know the tune, you play once for him, maybe twice, he'll get it immediately. But if you would ask him, could you explain this to me, he wouldn't be able to verbalize it. He would able to be able to show you on the guitar, but if you're not a guitar player, that's gonna be difficult to learn the tune that way. So, um, to know some theory is helpful. So what does it mean? I think you should know at least all the names of the chords. And that means uh, that you can actually verbalize the chord names of a tune. And that is not that difficult, right? You just learn all the two, five, ones in all keys. That's 12, two, five, ones, right? And then uh, the minor two, five, ones are the same letters. So you just have to know that instead of D minor seven, G seven, C, which is a two, five, one in C, it becomes D half diminished G seven, C minor. Um, you learn that, uh, you learn diminished chords, and they're, you know, I, of course you gotta know the note and the chord names and also what they look like on the guitar neck or on the piano. Um, what else do you need to know? Chord uh, diminished, minor, seven, major seven. But you don't know, you don't need to know the complicated names like uh, G7, sharp 11, that is not necessary, just know G7, and then when somebody wants you to play uh, a sharp 11 voicing like this, they, they can actually show you the voicing or say, I want this note in there. You can find the note, right? So knowing the, the complicated chord names is, is very useful also, but it's not necessary. Just know the basic chord names. Um, and you should know how to verbalize the form. So you should know, okay, this, this song is A, A, B, A, or this is a 12 bar blues form, or uh, this intro lasts six bars. There's intros of six bars, by the way, in Gypsy Jazz, or eight bars. So you need to be able to verbalize form. And this goes along with being able to hear form. And I talked about that. And if you can't hear form, and you'll be surprised, there's 
many people that have trouble hearing form. Even people that can, I know people that can immediately harmonize a melody, any given melody, right? Uh, you sing a song they might have never heard, but they, they're immediately able to harmonize the melody just because they trained the ears to hear harmony in such a way that they can harmonize uh, a simple theme. Lots of classical musicians, uh, theoretical classical musicians are able to do that. It's part of their, uh, the thing they have to be able to do, right? If you're a theory teacher in classical music, you need to be able to harmonize a theme in four part harmony. But uh, it doesn't mean that they can hear form. In fact, uh, a lot of times they cannot hear a jazz form. That's, some, that's something you have to train separately. And one way to train it is to learn the theme of a simple song. Let's say you're learning the theme of uh, I Can Give You Anything But Love. And then you sing the theme while you are listening to recording and somebody is soloing over that song. You, you, th you sing the theme in your head. And that way you're training yourself to connect their solo lines to the theme. And the theme is connected to the chords and the form. So that's the way I taught myself how to uh, hear form. I wasn't natural that when I was starting jazz, uh, jazz violin, I wasn't a natural at hearing form. I actually taught myself how to do that by that way, just learning how to sing themes in your head and then sing the themes along with solos, especially if, if it's a drum solo, it's, it, it's even more complicated. So that's a, a good tip, good trick. And it's also fun to do. Um, okay, uh, let next subject would be um, style conventions. That's, that's another thing that I think is important to know. So if you're playing Gypsy Jazz, I think it's important to know how those songs end, right? A lot of the songs end like... So it would help if you're a solo player to be able to play at the right time. And if you are a rhythm player that you know that you could play... Something like that. Same goes for intros. If you um, you need to be able to recognize intros and how long they last, even without people saying it to you. Somebody starts... Uh, and then you start the theme after that bar. You know that because you know how themes work in Gypsy Jazz. Now, if you are a chord player, I, th I think you should be able to play some of those intros uh, it, when somebody asks you, could you play an intro, that you have some of those intros under your fingers. Um, and then you have to know, as a solo player, you have to know which kind of lines are appropriate in that style. That doesn't mean that you cannot play any of the other lines, but as, as long as you understand how, what kind of lines, phrases are expected in the solo, you, you, you'll be good because then when you deviate from that, it's with a clear understanding of the style. So instead of learning rules for this, I think it's better to, again, study great lines. So let's say you play a bebop in a bebop band session. Then, of course, I could give you a list and say, well, you got to study uh, enclosures um, and all the lines. They start, uh, a lot of lines start with the third. They go to the nine or the flat nine. Instead of that, just study great people lines and you'll get to notice the, the conventions of that line, of those lines in uh, that style. And in Gypsy Jazz, for example, a lot of the lines are based around diminished arpeggios and the frigid dominant skill. But instead of le learning those things, although they might be useful, it's better to study great lines by great Gypsy Jazz players. Which brings me to the last subject, and that is the most important thing to train and that is your musicality. And now, there's many definitions of musicality, what it means. But for me, when I, when I say about someone, oh, that he's very musical, or when somebody else says to me, oh, he's very musical, what I hear is that that person has great musical taste, right? That guy knows, or that uh, gal knows what sounds good at what time. 
And the way they develop that is by listening to great players. Now, if I would have to learn a new style, let's say I want to play Indian ragas. I know nothing about Indian ragas. So in instead of me just trying to invent things on my own or, or just finding a random YouTube video about uh, with someone playing Indian ragas, I think it would be wise for me to go to an expert and, and let him point me to the right recording to listen to. So this is great raga playing. And the reasons why it's great, right? He said, well, it's great because he times in this way and he, he plays these kinds of phrases. So the same goes for gypsy jazz. If I'm a, a fusion player and I want to learn how to play gypsy jazz, instead of just going to a random YouTube video, then I might seek out an expert and he will tell me, you know, you got to listen to these recordings of Django, you got to listen to these recordings of the Rosenberg Trio and these recordings of the Duarte Lom, I don't know, anything. And the reason, and he will give me the reasons why it's great. And that way, by listening to that music, understanding why that music is considered to be great, I develop great musical taste in that style. And then in the end, when I start playing that style, after doing all the work, of course, learning the necessary chord voicings and the great lines, I can play with a great sense of musical taste. And people will say, oh, he, it's a very musical player. So these are the skills I think you need to have as a professional jazz musician. Doesn't mean, doesn't matter which style, gypsy jazz, bebop, fusion. Um, now I, I realized that I've said many things in this video that might be considered controversial and if you disagree with me, please let me know and we can have a discussion. Um, because all the things I said, I realize that they might not be the truth. It's just something that I experienced, experienced firsthand in the many years now that I've been playing uh, jazz professionally. Okay, uh, I hope we can get a conversation started and I see you in the next video. Bye.